What's up, Hope City Online? Happy Mother's Day. Excited to be with you today. I tell you what, this has been an unprecedented year. 2020 and 2021, crazy, crazy times. Who would have thought that we would have been back-to-back -back Mother's Days in a pandemic? Ridiculous, right? And it's it's been pretty wild, pretty crazy. I mean, honestly, moms, you're probably feeling it more than anyone else. Uh, you've got the kids at home. They're finally going back to school. Thank you, Jesus. But you've had the kids at home. You've had to run the house. You've had to take care of your job, which moved home. And you had to become a teacher all at the same time. And uh, let's just take a moment and just give it up for moms. Like, moms coming in clutch in 2021, making it happen. And finally, finally, kids are going back to school, so you're getting a little bit of a break. But definitely, this has been a season where even as things are starting to get back to normal, um, people are saying things like, something still feels off. Something feels like it's missing. There's a, a lot of people that I've talked to, they feel like there's a, a disconnect or um, a, a, an overwhelming sense of hopelessness, even though hope feels like it's right around the corner. It seems like a lot of people are lacking confidence or direction. They seem to have drifted into bad habits and now they're struggling to get sort of a routine or a rhythm back in, in play to where they can have a healthy relationship, not only with God, but with others. And, you know, it's, it's life isn't working so good. And a lot of people um, have said things like, well, you know what it is? It's church. We haven't been able to be at church in person in such a long time that that's what it is. We're missing church. And and I think that there's probably a, a bit to that. I think there's a piece of that being in community, but I think it's so much more than that. In fact, church as we know it wasn't even named church and Jesus was the first person to really kind of give the organization that we call church nowadays its moniker. In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says, and he's talking to Peter in this moment and the other disciples, but he's saying something to him about the leadership that he'll provide for the people during troubling times. And so I think this is appropriate. Like, like He's like, things are going to be hard. Things are going to be difficult. But Peter, I'm going to do something in and through you. And listen to what he says. He says, and, and you, Peter, and that means rock. And he says, on this rock, on you, Peter, will be the foundation, the first piece of the puzzle on which I build my church. And then he says something really powerful. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even when all hell breaks loose, the church is powerful. The church is strong. Now, again, some of you are really grateful because you're back in church in person this morning. And, you know, all the month of May, we're going to have in-person services for you to be at. But for those of you who are watching online and you're far away or you're not able or not ready to come back to in person, I'm glad that you're with us. But here's the deal. What does it mean? Because Jesus is the first person to call the church the church. But it's not the first time that the church is talked about in Scripture. In fact, if you look throughout the Old Testament, the church is talked about. Sometimes it's referred to as the, and I will, I'll say it like this, the Old Testament church or Israel. It's talking about God's people, a collection of people who call themselves by the name of Yahweh. But in if you look at different passages, you can see that there's metaphor and meaning that's directed towards the church in most of the scripture that you can really look at it and pay attention to. And so today I want to look at a passage that I think fits Mother's Day, obviously, but I also think it fits this idea of what does it mean to be the church in these unprecedented times. And that's Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is probably the most uh, uh, famous of passages to describe what a godly woman is supposed to look like. Unfortunately, Proverbs 31 has been abused so many times that it makes a lot of women feel uncomfortable. Uh, a lot of moms feel like they're not good enough. It's almost like before there was Instagram to compare your life to or Pinterest to compare your life to, that there was this passage in scripture that you had to compare your life to. But let me tell you something, Proverbs 31 is completely and totally different than what we've used it for for all these years. It isn't actually a resume of righteousness or a job description for what a godly woman is supposed to look like. In fact, Proverbs 31 was an aspirational song and poem singing about the beauty, the grandeur, the wonder of the Hebrew woman. In fact, it was often sung 
two women at the end of the day by the father around the table with the family to say there's something powerful and dynamic about your mom, about my wife, about this woman, about women in general that seem to have this ability to hold life together for all of us. Now, it's interesting to me if you look at Proverbs 31, and today I want to take do something a little bit different. I want to take Proverbs 31, and we're going to start at verse 10, but then we're going to do something kind of interesting with it, if you'll let me. Proverbs 31, verse 10, it says, Who could ever find a wife like this one? She is a woman of strength and mighty valor. She is full of wealth and wisdom. The price paid for her is greater than many jewels. Now, if you take that same passage, Proverbs 31, and you do something with it, you, you change the phrasing of wife, woman, and you insert the word church. Now remember, right? Jesus refers to us as the church. He says, Peter, I'm, you're going to use you. You're going to be the founder, the builder, the, the forerunner of the church. So remember what the church is. We as the church are the bride of Christ. So it's not inappropriate for us to take that phrase, wife, woman, right? And substitute it with the word church. So if we're the bride, so the church and Jesus would be the groom, so he'd be the husband. So let's look at a few passages from Proverbs 31 and look at it instead of from the vantage point of a godly woman, what would it look like if we were a Proverbs 31 church? Let's look at that verse, verse 10 again. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who could ever find a church like this one? Christ's church is full of strength and mighty valor. The church is full of wealth and wisdom. The price paid for the church was greater than many jewels. Skip down to verses 13 and 14. The church searches out continually to possess that which is pure and righteous. The church gives out revelation and truth to feed others. Skip down to verse 18. The church tastes and experiences a better substance and her shining light will not be extinguished no matter how dark the night. Look at verse 20. The church is known by her extravagant generosity to the poor, for she always reaches out her hand to those in need. Look at verse 23. Her husband, Jesus, is famous and admired by all. Why? Well, Jesus in and of himself is famous and admired, yes. But the church continues to make the name of Jesus famous by the things that the church does in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 29. There are many valiant and noble ones, but you have ascended above them all. Popularity can be misleading, and the followers and wealth of this worldly clout can be totally vain, and it fades quickly. But the church, the bride of Christ, lives in the wonder and awe and the fear of the Lord. She will be praised throughout eternity. Proverbs 31, 29 through 30. Now think about that for a second. What if you looked at the Proverbs 31 passage, and certainly it is a song of praise to what it's like to have a godly woman in your life who goes before you, who prays for you, who's a caretaker, who's, who's a, a, a defender, who's a warrior. I mean, the, the Proverbs 31 woman, she's everything. And again, it's aspirational. Not everyone can be all of these things. But what if we, the collective body of the church, looked at this passage and said, as the bride of Christ, what if we represented Jesus? What if we did such a great job of being his bride that we cared for the hurting, the broken, and the poor? What would it look like? In this season, when everything is unprecedented, when everything is chaotic, when everything is sideways and crazy, and it feels like even things are starting to normalize, nothing feels normal again. When it still feels like there's something missing, what is it that's missing? I mean, maybe you've missed feeling normal. I get it. There's something comforting about going out to a restaurant and sitting down in public and being with people and feeling normal again. Maybe you've missed being out in public and, or, or maybe it's just even just being somewhere with your mask on is still just really uncomfortable for you and it reminds you of a post-apocalyptic worldview. I, I don't know. Maybe it's that you've missed going to church. I get that. You've missed going to church, but perhaps... 
it's not just your view of the world around you, but it's the view that you have of yourself. Perhaps you've limited your view of yourself. And if you looked at this verse, Proverbs 31, if you looked at this collection of beautiful statements made about a godly bride, and you applied them to your life as the bride of Christ, what could you do in the name of Jesus? What do I mean by that? Well, I mean this. The world needs you right now to be the church way more than you ever missed going to a church building. I'm going to tell you right now. The world needs you to be the church way more than you ever missed going to church. Now, I, I get it that, you know, like it, it's, it's difficult in this season for us to shift our minds and to see ourselves the way that God sees us because the world around us is taking most of our attention. But I'm telling you right now, if you shift your mindset, if you shift the way you see yourself, you'd be surprised what God can do in and through you. You hear us say it all the time. We don't just go to church, right? We are the church. But I want you to, to shift that from just something that you say or something that you hear or something you repeat back to me when I say, we don't just go to church, we are the church. I want you to shift it to something that starts to truly become who you are. I mean, if you can go to church, that means you can leave church. Listen to me now. If the attendance on a Sunday is dependent on your salvation, what would happen in this world if we weren't allowed to go to church on Sunday again? Now, this time it was because of a virus and it was temporary and we made decisions as a church to honor God and to live our lives in such a way that we cared about and we, we shined the truth of God, the gospel in our community by being safe. But what's going to happen in our world when church becomes illegal? What's going to happen in our world when oppression really happens? If your attendance is the basis of your salvation, then when you can't attend, are you no longer saved? This is the problem with going to church. It's so much more. Whether it's in person or online, going isn't enough. Being the church is what God's calling us to. Church can't be a destination. It has to become your identity. In the same way that we talk about the Proverbs 31 woman, a wife of noble character, church, this is your identity. You are the bride of Christ. You're not a building, you're a people. And so we're supposed to be a people that's here for the world. And so what we do when we gather together, whether it's here online or in person at in-person gatherings, what we're doing is we're practicing for what we'll do when we go back to work, back to school, back to our homes, back to our families. The church was never supposed to be a place where we hide. The church is supposed to be a place where we prepare ourselves to go and be. Be the men and women of God he's called us to be. Yes, Jesus is the first person to mention the church, and he refers to it as his bride. So if we are the bride of Christ, if he's daddy and we're mommy, doesn't that mean that the people that come to Jesus through our ministry become the children of God, our children as well? I mean, we're their caretakers. I mean, if you don't want to see it that way, if that's too weird for you, think of yourself as a foster parent at least. That you have these people temporarily to care for them and let God do what he has to do in and through them. When you read Matthew 16, 18, he says, Peter, on you I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, nothing is going to touch my kids. I think about my wife in a moment like this. I think about when, you know, she's pretty mellow most of the time. She's pretty easygoing most of the time. But boy, you start messing with her children and there's something that happens inside of her. And she goes from that pretty girl with the big hooped earrings to she starts pulling her earrings out and popping off her nails and ready to fight. You don't want to mess with a mama's children. And yet somehow as the church, we've lost sight of that the world are supposed to be these kids, these orphans that we're adopting and pulling in. And this battle that we're waging isn't a flesh and blood battle. There's a spiritual warfare thing here. And we're going to war against people who are the orphans who need to be cared for because we've lost sight of who we are as the bride of Christ. So what's missing? 
Well, probably the fact of the matter that you are engaged in a spiritual battle. You probably have lost sight of that because of the physical battle that you've been in. And I get that. It's been a tough season. It's been a tough season for those of you who have had to do double, triple, quadruple duty. I've been very fortunate. Most of my children are grown and moved out of the house. And so I haven't had to put, take care of them in the same way that you've had to, those of you who have had little ones. But I want to tell you something. This isn't a battle about whether or not you can get your kid to potty train or do their homework. This is a spiritual battle, whether or not you can develop disciples of Christ. And sometimes we get stuck with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with our bosses, and we battle over things that aren't eternal. And so when we say the gates of hell will not prevail against us, what he's saying is, is that we have the ability to speak the name of Jesus, to speak the truth of God's word, to be the bride of Christ, that nurturing, loving, powerfully valor-filled men and women of God that he's called us to be. And so when we say that our purpose is to bring hope to the world, what do we mean? Well, we mean engage the community. Like you need to be a blessing to the people around you. You need to be eating with these people. You need to be praying for these people. You need to be serving these people. You need to be giving and generous with these people. You need to be inviting them to come and be a part of the body of Christ. The church was never meant to be a place where we would hide from the problems in this world. The church was meant to be a place where we would gather together as his church and prepare ourselves to add to the family. This beautiful place where we could gather people together. And again, the format doesn't really matter. What day of the week, whether it's online, whether it's in person, it's are we being the bride of Christ? And adopting those who need a family. Well, there's no place to go. Well, then who are we? Well, there's a lot of people that feel that. There's a lot of people that are separated and distant. And so one of the things I want to challenge you with in this next season of your life is to develop a rhythm. And some of these will be building new rhythms in your life. Now, whether it's hope at home or in-person services, like being intentional about that 10 o'clock hour every Sunday morning where you and your family, whether you're gathering around the couch with your Bibles and your notepads or you're transitioning into in-person services, that you are making an intentional decision to be in church. A lot of you guys come to me on a regular basis and you go, Pastor, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And, and part of the, the thing I want to tell you is, man, if you would have just heard my sermon two weeks ago, I would have answered all these questions for you. That's why being together as the church is important. And again, the format doesn't matter. Whether it's hope at home or hope in person, we're supposed to be bringing hope to the world one person at a time. There's some power about these cameras and the ability to bring hope to the world today. But there's also something about you taking that hope and applying it to your life and making it part of what you do in your everyday. I want to challenge you to build a rhythm of being in a home group. Well, pastor, I've been in life groups and connect groups and Bible study groups in the past. Listen, there's something that I want to get through to you. A home group is different than anything you've ever done before. And we're going to be navigating what it looks like for you to build powerful, dynamic community where you build family. And it doesn't matter whether you meet at a coffee shop or restaurant or in an actual home is that you build an atmosphere of home in the same way that we're the bride of Christ then where we go becomes his sanctuary or his home. That we would make it an abiding place, a place where hope lives. Now, celebration gatherings are super important. The first Sunday of every month, we gather together. And so those of you who are in San Diego and you're capable of doing this, I really want to challenge you to make celebration gatherings a priority. These are prime times for you to invite people to church. These are prime times for you to be at church. And so I get that your kids have sports or you have a trip. The first Sunday of every month is a please do not miss because you're not going to want to miss out on what God's going to be doing in and through us as his people. And then as we have worship nights or compassion and serve or invitation days, uh, you know, as you begin to step out in your generosity to the point where it becomes irrational generosity, as we're building these new rhythms, you'd be surprised what God is doing. We believe at Hope City Church that the local church is the hope of the world. It's you and I, the bride of Christ, that have the ability to bring hope to the world one person at a time. 
But we have to stop being spiritual consumers and we have to start being spiritual contributors. And so when I say we exist to bring hope to the world one person at a time, what I mean by that is, well, like one moment at a time, one, you know, like one family at a time, one conversation at a time, what, like gathering together and it's one hamburger at a time, it's one drink at a time, it's one conversation at a time. It's you engaging the world. It's a powerful moment when you realize this thing about yourself. That when we're unified, we can do amazing things and we can be on mission. And we can lead people to become these amazing, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21, I want to leave you with this passage today. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us. To him be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever. If I could leave you with one thing today, I would leave you with this. The world needs you to be the bride of Christ, to be the church, way more than you ever missed church attendance. The world needs you to be the hands and feet, the compassionate mother figure to the orphans of this world, emotionally, physically, spiritual orphans everywhere, who in this chaotic season have lost hope. Something isn't right. Something still feels off, but you have the answer, the answer that is Jesus. And if we, as his church, step up and step out, I'm going to tell you something right now, ain't nothing going to mess with the children that are adopted into the family of God. The gates of hell will not prevail in Jesus' name.